Well, as we continue today in the Beatitudes and Jesus' introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to keep on reminding us that the Beatitudes are inviting people to a life of blessing in the kingdom of heaven. And with all the Beatitudes, there's a relationship between the situation or the need in our lives that Jesus mentions and the promise of blessing in the kingdom of heaven. So listen first to Matthew 5, verse 6. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now to understand what Jesus is saying, of course, we need to know what righteousness means. And again, how many times did the word righteousness come up in your conversation this last week? Okay, so let's be clear. In the Old and the New Testaments, the term translated as righteousness generally means three things. It can either be first, the ethical conduct that is demanded by the law of Moses. Second, it can refer to the salvation, which is a gift of God through Jesus Christ. And third, the ethical conduct which is demanded of every Christian. And what sense is being conveyed depends on the context where we read it in the Bible. In Matthew 5, verse 6, Jesus speaks of righteousness as God's gift. So he's talking about hungering and thirsting for the gift of God to us. Now we can hunger and thirst for all kinds of things, not all of them good, not all of them helpful, not all of them hopeful, like drugs or pornography, for example. So we want to be wise about what we hunger and thirst for in life because we are what we eat, not only physically, but spiritually. For example, potato chips, cheese curls, and candy may be some of your favorite things to eat. But a few years ago, for some mule deer in Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona, these foods proved deadly. And park rangers, I learned, had to kill over two dozen mule deer at Grand Canyon National Park because they became hooked on junk food left by visitors to the park. And the rangers said that once the deer get a taste of the sugar and salt, they develop an extreme addiction and will go to any lengths just to get junk food. And the result is the animals ignore the food they really need leaving them in poor health and on the edge of starvation. And it's not funny, but one park ranger called junk food the crack cocaine of the deer world. (laughs) Jesus warns us of the dangers of hungering and thirsting for junk because such a diet keeps us from hungering and thirsting for the things of God. Righteousness, the ethical conduct which is demanded of a Christian, meeting the standards of what is morally right and just, is a repeated theme in the Gospel of Matthew and throughout the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus first came to John the Baptist to be baptized, John initially prevented him, feeling it was inappropriate for Jesus to be baptized by him. But Jesus said, let it be so now, for it is proper in this way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Two more times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will address the issue of righteousness. Later on in chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And there can you see he's not talking about the gift of salvation. He's talking about our lives. And then in chapter 6, verse 33, he reminds us, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now we're going to deal with those texts in the future, but I want to say today that Jesus is not lowering the expectations for righteousness. He's altering them. And Jesus expects striving to live in the righteousness of God's kingdom. Striving to live in the righteousness of God's kingdom will be a top priority for all of us who are following him. Now later on in chapter 21 and verse 32, Jesus says in response to his critics questioning his authority, he says, truly I tell you that tax collectors and prostitutes 
are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The tax collectors and prostitutes believed John's word, and they came confessing their sins, and they were baptized and began living their lives differently. Jesus' critics and their spiritual descendants in our time continually fall into the same self-righteous trap of focusing on other people and their sins, faults, and failures rather than focusing on our own. And spiritually, this is one of the worst things we can do in life. Rather than hungering and thirsting for self-justification, Jesus urges hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And those who do so will be filled by Christ in the kingdom of heaven, and we see that in the Gospels. For example, Jesus said to a woman of Samaria at Jacob's well in John chapter 4, verse 14, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Really quickly, um, yesterday morning when I got up, it was pouring. It was pouring out. And when I looked out our sliding doors towards our deck, all this water was just pouring over the edge of the gutter because the gutter was stuck. So I ended up going outside in the pouring rain and clearing the downspouts. And part of what I was thinking of was this scripture. Because, you know, I was thinking about my sermon and all, and talking about righteousness. And it was amazing to me, though, how just a few leaves and twigs could block the flow of so much water. And I just thought, so it is in our lives. You know, Jesus wants to give us this living water, wants to pour it into us. But a little bit of unrighteousness can block a lot of what God wants to do. At least that's what I thought on the top of my ladder in the pouring rain. <laughs> Malcolm Muggeridge, who is perhaps best known for his book about Mother Teresa, Something Beautiful for God, wrote the following. He said, I may, I suppose, regard myself or pass for being a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admissions to the higher slopes of the internal revenue. That's success. Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may partake of trendy diversions. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated for me to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet I say to you, and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by a million, add them all together, and they are nothing, less than nothing, a positive impediment measured against one draft of that living water Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. Nothing satisfies the hunger of the human heart and soul like Jesus. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul makes the point that after Jesus has done so much for us, then it's up to us as we seek to grow in righteousness to feed the right hunger and thirst and to starve those things that are not of Christ in our lives. Paul says, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members, present your body, to God as instruments of righteousness. And through feeding and drinking on the life of the Spirit of Christ, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And in the kingdom, the merciful will not be taken advantage of. They won't be ridiculed or judged as they so often are today when they're seen as weak or pushovers or naive. Jesus says, 
they will receive mercy in the kingdom of heaven and on the day of judgment. Mercy is a hugely important theme in the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 9, verse 13, when Jesus' critics attacked him for eating with sinners, he replied, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Then in chapter 12, verse 7, when his critics were ripping him for violating the Sabbath laws and plucking heads of grain with his disciples on the Sabbath, Jesus replies by telling two Bible stories and then saying again, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. There are few things that could have a greater impact on improving the quality of human life at every level of our society than an increase in mercy. I just want that to sink in. Just imagine if everybody you know, beginning with yourself, if we were more merciful, how would that impact and change the world in which we live? Many times in Matthew, people with physical needs beg Jesus for mercy for themselves or for a loved one. In chapter 9, verse 27, it's two blind men crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David. In chapter 15, verse 22, it's a Canaanite woman who comes to plead for her daughter. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. In chapter 17, in verse 15, it's a father kneeling before Jesus and begging, Lord, have mercy on my son. In chapter 20, in verses 30 to 31, it's two more blind men shouting, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And all the people tried to get them to shut up. And it says they shouted even more loudly, have mercy on us. And in every single case, Jesus has mercy on those who are hurting and in need and broken. Being merciful in Jesus' name within our families, in our church, in our community, and in this world is one of the most attractive and inviting and Christ-like things we can do. And being merciful not only makes us more like Christ, it makes you feel better. It lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your stress level. Your primary care physician will thank you for being more merciful. And it's one of the most effective ways to earn a hearing for the gospel. People really don't care what you think about the origins of the Scripture or the authority of the Bible. I don't mean to disappoint anybody, but for people who are unchurched, they really couldn't care less what you think about that. But being merciful earns people's respect, and it gets their attention. You could argue pretty convincingly from Scripture that the strongest condemnation of Jesus Christ is reserved specifically for people who are not merciful. Jesus tells a parable about an unforgiving servant in Matthew 18 and verses 33 to 35, and in it Jesus says through the king in the story, should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I emphasize the mercy of God, but it is a little scary that the only time torture is mentioned in the Gospels, the people who are tortured are the people who are not merciful. Something to keep in mind for your own sake. In Matthew chapter 23, a chapter filled with blistering judgment for the unmerciful, self-righteous, hypocritical critics of Christ, Jesus says in a woe, which is the opposite of a beatitude or a blessing, that they have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced. God has shown us incredible mercy. And we're to do the same to other people. It's as simple as that. 
and we need mercy the most when we deserve it the least. I read a story about a man reminiscing about a kindly Amish family, the Royers, that lived near his childhood home. And he wrote, one night a group of drunken high school boys went to the Royer farm after a football game and began breaking watermelons, the produce that provided the mainstay of their annual income. And while the boys were yelling and cussing in the field, the light of a glowing lantern began flickering in an upstairs bedroom in the farmhouse. And from the field, the boys could see the lantern being carried down the stairs, out onto the front porch, and as the light approached them through the darkness, the boys prepared for a fight. Now I want you to take a moment and think, what would you have done if you were Mr. Royer? Think what you would have done in that situation. You might even want to write your answer down. You might not. Can you think what you would be doing in that situation? Drunken kids breaking your watermelons? Threatening your income? Well, instead of a fight or a rebuke, Mr. Royer told the boys they could have all the melons they wanted, but that the melons they were breaking were not his best. And he offered to lead them to his field where his best melons were, and he would give them as many as they wanted. And the boys were embarrassed. And they respectfully apologized before leaving. Mr. Royer invited them in for a glass of lemonade. He said they needed it. And the boys declined, trying to soak in a vivid lesson in Christian character. Okay, so let me ask you, how many of you wrote down, offer the drunken vandals my best watermelons and a glass of lemonade? <laughs> Anybody? Any? I didn't come up with that answer either the first time I read that story. But Hebrews 4.16 encourages us when we've been breaking watermelons or when we're feeling tempted to just go break some watermelons or when we feel like we've been wronged because somebody's been breaking ours. Hebrews 4.16 encourages us to turn to Jesus so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Perhaps the strongest words about the importance of mercy, other than those of Jesus, come in James 2.13. These words haunt me. For judgment will be without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. If you want to see an awakening of the church in America, you know when it's going to happen? When the unchurched see that mercy triumphs over judgment in the church. Right now, I suspect if you ask most unchurched people, they'd say judgment clearly triumphs over mercy when it comes to the church. And that is to our shame, because it should be the other way around. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Very quickly, I want to close with a story that Gordon McDonald tells about an experience he and his wife Gail had on an airplane flying back to Boston. He said, we were seated almost at the back of the airliner in the two aisle seats across from each other. As the plane loaded up, a woman with two small children came down the aisle to take the seat right in front of us and behind her another woman. The two women took the A and C seats and one of the child sat in the middle seat and the second child was on the lap of the other woman and I figured these were two mothers traveling together with their kids and I hoped the kids wouldn't be noisy. The flight started and my prayer was not answered. The two children had a tough time. The air was turbulent. The children cried a lot. Their ears hurt. It was a miserable flight. I watched as these two women kept trying to help and comfort these children. The woman at the window played with the child in the middle seat, trying to make her feel good and paying lots of attention. And I thought these women should get a medal for what they're trying to do. But things went downhill from there. As we got towards the last part of the flight, the child in the middle seat got sick. And the next thing I knew, she was losing everything from every part of her body. The diaper wasn't on tight, and before long, a stench began to rise through the cabin. It was unbearable. I could see over the top of the seat that indescribable stuff was all over everything. It was on the woman's clothes. It was all over the seat. It was on the floor. It was one of the most repugnant scenes I had seen in a long time. 
I watched as the woman next to the window patiently comforted the child, tried her best to clean up the mess and to make something out of a bad situation. The plane landed, and as we pulled up to the gate, everybody else on the plane was just waiting to run off and exit as fast as we could. The flight attendant came up with paper towels and handed them to the woman in the window seat and said, Here, ma'am, these are for your little girl. And the woman said, This isn't my little girl. Aren't you traveling together? The flight attendant asked. No. I've never seen this woman or her children before in my life. The woman replied. And suddenly, I realized this woman had just been merciful. A lot of us would have just died in that circumstance. Complaining up one side and down the other, she found the opportunity to give mercy. We're told so many times in the Bible, the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. It's in Exodus, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in 2 Chronicles, it's in Nehemiah, it's in the Psalms multiple, multiple times. It's in Joel, it's in Jonah, it's in James. We worship a merciful God. So we should not be surprised that Jesus says the merciful will be blessed and shall receive mercy. Most of us, I'll say most of us, not all, so if any of you want to feel like that's you, you can. Most of us don't deserve mercy, and yet God gives it to us because we need mercy the most when we deserve it the least. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. God, we thank you once again for the gift of your word. And we thank you even as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table and to remember the extent to which your mercy went for our sake. God, help us to be grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.